Yes, we definitely have it. Okay. Uh, let's come to order then at 6.01. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, reminder, housekeeping. If you're not talking, could you please mute your microphone, which if you're not familiar is at least on my screen in the bottom left hand corner of the Zoom window. Um, and if you're on the telephone, star six will mute your telephone. And star six will also unmute your telephone when you're, um, when you're ready to speak. And Keith, um, correct me if I'm wrong, star nine, um, uh, raise a hand. Yeah, great, okay, getting there. Thank you very much. Um, so before we move into public comments, I think many of you know that we suffered a tremendous loss over this past weekend with the death of Nate Picard, our head custodian at Rumney. We honor Nate's life and uh, his great contributions to Rumney School and, and to our communities. And we grieve with his family, uh, his friends and, and his colleagues. When, when an event, a terrible event like this uh, happens without warning at a sensitive time, it sends shock waves first and foremost to those who are closest to him. But um, ultimately, it affects all of us. So um, feeling unsettled or, um, or wrong, or if you need to talk about any of this, I, I urge you to, um, to talk with people you love, people you like, or maybe just people you work with. Um, all we have is each other, but um, either a lot be very powerful. Um, so I miss you, Nate. Anyway, um, first round of public comments. Uh, please, if a member of the public, you raise your hand if you click on the participants icon also in the bottom row of your um, Zoom window, or and if you're on the telephone, star nine will show you a um, raised hand um, on mine so that I can call on you. Scott, and I, don't, there... I don't see that, but I have a comment. Ellen, of course, you, and you're welcome to just speak. Okay, so, thank you. Please, go right ahead. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how the public comment section works anymore. I don't know if, um, I mean, I have some comments to make on a particular agenda item. Do I make them now or do I make them during the discussion of that agenda item? Yeah, um, you should make them now with Zoom. We found it, um, otherwise it is completely uncontrollable um, to do as we were doing in our, in our physical meetings. Um, when we're able to involve the public and we're sort of at, at the time of the, de of the actual debate. But um, I should just mention, in addition to the first round of public comments now, there's a second round at the very end, so that um, members of the public, uh, citizens may sort of comment on, on uh, what you've seen and heard and um, tell us if you think we went wrong or went right, um, sometimes happens. So please feel free to speak your piece now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to um, make a comment or two about the uh, VSBA dues. 
um, that's coming up. Um, I would strongly urge the board not to support the VSBA by paying them almost $8,000 um, for several reasons. Um, I thought that the pros and con paper that the superintendent put together was uh, really nice. It was nice to see the pros and the cons. Um, Actually, um, don't blame the superintendent for that, Ellen. Oh, I'm not blaming uh, it. I thought it was great. <laughs> Um, I, I think that ultimately where he says at the end that, um, it, it was kind of no harm, no foul for not being a member of the VSBA for us. And unfortunately the VSBA did not do anything to change their ways. Um, one of the things that's concerning to me about the VSBA is that um, we had four out of five schools in our district who were um, engaged in the appeal of Act 46. Um, and that, that was something that Scott O'Dell spoke to the legislature and um, said that people who were appealing this and were within their legal rights to appeal were committing, um, oh, I can't remember what the word was. Um, they were like. Um, uh, sorry, if I might help was civil disobedience yeah. or something? Help me. Um, yeah, civil disobedience. And you know, that's just not a really fair statement, but I sat at uh, meetings in the legislature listening to Scott O'Dell um, and I, I really wasn't clear as to why he was so pro Act 46 and not looking out for not only the four of the five schools in our district, but the many schools who had joined that appeal um, under their legal right to do so. Um, and I also sat and um, I, I felt like it was unfortunate that our regional rep was sitting with Nicole Mace and um, Mr. O'Dell at those legislative hearings when four out of the five schools in our district had joined that appeal. Um, also, about a year ago, maybe in May or June of last year, this came up for a debate at um, one of the board meetings when we still had them in person. And um, at that meeting, Nicole Mays was asked why she brought a suit, why the VSBA brought a suit against the teachers union when they were involved in the middle of the healthcare negotiations. Um, and she said it wasn't the VSBA that did it, but then was shown the papers that had the VSBA on the, on the um, papers that sh showed they were a part of it. And Mr. O'Dell or nor Nicole Mace sought to rectify that. And I think it really showed, I mean, I, I, I'm gonna use the word prevaricate. I'm not gonna say they were liars, but they were really, it was real slippery. And I don't know that this is the kind of organization that we want to be a part of. And maybe, it, maybe we just need to say no again and maybe that will make them think twice. I think the fact that we have been able to come up with policies during the past year, and thank you to all the people who are on the policy committees, um, because that was one of the, the, the features that I had heard over and over again, oh, we, can't, we won't be able to create any policies unless we belong to the VSBA. Well, um, I guess we were able to do it on our own, so you know, good for us, um, but I, I hesitate um, to give them almost $8,000. Um, the other thing is, you know, I see on Front Porch Forum, U32 is trying to raise money to buy uh, milk crates for students. Why doesn't some of that, if we have $8,000, let's use some of that to give $8,000 or some of that to students, um, for students to have a milk crate to sit on outside. 
I'm not, and, and I'm sure there's $500 somewhere to do that for them. But in any event, um, I think if ultimately this board does decide to do it, which I would really hope they don't, uh, don't decide to fund that this year, um, again, that um, any school board member that represents us at those meetings for in any capacity is someone who has no prior ties to the VSBA. I think that someone would need to have fresh eyes, a fresh attitude about the VSBA, someone who can look at it objectively and um, uh, you know, come maybe to the VSBA with new ideas to help them improve. Um, and I, I just, I feel like that is perhaps the way to go if this board's going to do it. And again, I, I really hope the board does not decide to fund it. I don't, I don't think we've been any worse for the wear without joining them. So thank you. Thanks very much, Ellen. Um, we'll, uh, we'll keep this fresh in our minds for the discussion to follow. Um, other public comments, please? If there are any? Okay. Um, uh, uh, yes, uh, Corinne. Yeah, Is hi, I tried their star nine, and then I'm very sorry, my landline rang. Oh my gosh. Anyway, two items. I'm hoping that this year the board will continue to work on community engagement, although I think in my mind, a better word would be involvement, maybe community engagement and involvement. And the other item is the VSBA, which I think Ellen did a fine job. So I, was, I won't say much other than my opinion to not pay the VSBA dues has not changed since last year. To me, there really hasn't been anything that showed us that we can expect them to better represent us. And I don't think we've really had enough time to see a change, but I would certainly um, second what Ellen said about not funding them this year, not going with them. And, and I agree, I think the policy work uh, went rather well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Corinne. So um, community engagement and, and <clears throat> with Ellen, praise for the policy committee, let that not go unnoticed. Uh, so I, I believe that is all for public comments. Um, some of those inspired at the last moment. In which case, let's move on to agenda revisions. Have we any? Brian, um, are you aware of any? No, not, not at this time. Great. Um, Flores, any revisions? No? Okay. No, thanks. Okay. Um, in that case, I'm hoping Towns is able to um, Towns, I, I don't see him. Um, am I, am I correct in that? Or you're shaking your head, Jonas. Is that right? You don't see, he's not there. Okay. Um, good. And well, not that good actually, but, um, uh, he's, it's his last week before he starts school, so he's entitled, um, Block three, board operations, 3.1, board retreat again. Um, Flora, would you like to take the lead? Sure, uh, we have just some cleanup for getting ready for the, for the board retreat. One is a reminder that Michelle sent an email to all of you uh, to pick uh, your, your lunch and your appetizers. So please, we just have seven replies so far, so please make sure to fill that. We need to submit that by September 8th. 
Uh, the second one is that we have come up with an agenda that we will share with you uh, uh, next Monday uh, or Tuesday. Uh, so you have time to see it before uh, the retreat. And our hope is that, uh, you know, we took into consideration all of your input. And after brainstorming with uh, Scott, Brian and Nick, I, I think that you're all gonna be uh, happy and it will be productive. Uh, we're looking forward and the last, uh, uh, just check in is that it, so far most people have replied that they're coming in person. The only way to join, and I have touched base with a couple with the, uh, who can't join in in person. And the only way that we'd be able to have remote is really by uh, by phone. We're trying to have most of the meeting outs that we'll be going in and out, and just in a for us to be able to communicate better, the only other way would be, it would be kind of a conference call. We are not able to do it as Zoom because we're not planning on any formal presentation. It's, it's all conversation. So, so far, people at Canton seem to be okay with that. So I just wanted to make that clear. Our hope is that we're setting the meeting with, so if you feel comfortable and if you don't have anybody sick in your family or you know, by following all the precautions, if you are feeling comfortable that you would be there in in person and just, you know, let us know if, if you, you can't so far, people can't be there are okay with the, just the phone. Any questions? That's it. So September 12th, 830. We'll see you there. Thank you, Flora. Uh, Brian, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Nope. Great. Oh, sorry. Um, I didn't didn't hear that. Sorry. Uh, I think Flora took care of it. So thank you. Excellent. Great. Okay. Um, any questions from board members about the retreat? Uh, just a thank you for um, for accommodating uh, me remotely. I appreciate it. Thank you, Flora. You're welcome. Great. Um, other questions or observations? Okay. Terrific. Let's move on then to to the issue that you've all been waiting for. I'm sure um, the SBA dues. Um, those of you old timers, um, I guess, those of you who like me um, feel as though you've aged 12 years in the past 12 months will remember that this debate last year um, had a certain uh, storm and stress aspect to it, uh, which um, made it one of the more difficult discussions that we've had. Um, but in a peculiar way, I think one of the more sort of um, admirable ones in, in my view anyway, um, however, uh, for me, and, and Ellen, I should point out that um, I was actually the one who wrote that, that one pager. And, um, and poor Neil O'Dell being called Scott probably has him turning pirouettes. <laughs> uh, in any event, my, after, after that last year, I was, I, I guess I must have expected there to be consequences proportional to the, um, to the energy that went into that discussion. Um, and in the end, as I think, uh, I mean, you were, you had noticed, Ellen, it was a, a little bit of an anti-climax from, from that point of view, essentially, we had a um, just a dynamic, powerful policy committee that um, did great work, uh, even without that uh, direct connection to VSBA. And um, VSBA, those who voted against paying the dues, were hoping that that gesture might lead to some changes in VSBA, and that doesn't really seem to have happened either, at least not, um, not noticeably. 
So I was hoping that this year we would be able to maybe approach it a little bit differently. And um, I think anticipating what I expect our retreat will get into with uh, nature, an approach that's and that Jonas is already familiar with from negotiations committee, focusing on, on interests and trying to just get clear on what our interests are with regard to the SBA and make our decision on that basis. So instead of um, history is, history matters. Um, as does everything else, all the other good things that the SBA does. Um, but I think if we focus on interests, I do try to um, orient our decision that way. It might um, it might just be a, a more productive experience discussing it. I don't know. It's permanent, like everything else. So um, with that, I'd like to throw it open to whoever would like to um, make the first point. Stephen, look. Um, I mean, I have thoughts on the decision, but my, my first point would be, um, I, I think it it's inappropriate to try to do interest-based, um, similar to negotiations. It requires training. It requires buy-in. It, requ it requires process to hack happen prior to it being utilized. So um, I I'm not saying be mindful of how we discuss things, but, um, and Jonas can weigh in, he could feel differently. We frequently take different spins on things and that's great. Um, but, but I'm not sure the interest-based bargaining approach um, can work for this issue. Thanks, Stephen. I, I, as I often do, I, I may have explained myself poorly. I didn't mean to um, you know, sort of do an interest-based bargaining only to, um, to orient ourselves to what our interests are in the discussion rather than rather than sort of um, fall back fall back solely on history or solely on you know um, the bright side of things but that's all it, it's it, it, Diane. What I'm wondering about is if it makes sense for this to become part of our retreat conversation. Um, if we're talking about setting goals, we're talking about making a work plan, so to speak, of, of what we're doing. To me, part of that would be looking at what are the resources, what are the ways that we can achieve what our plans are. And then to me, that could address um, what our what are those resources and what is the work that the VSBA could help us achieve? So I wonder if it makes sense to do that. Um, I, I thank you very much, Diane. I think timing may be an issue is no, yes, no. I, I, I just wanna say that I, as we have been planning the retreat, I would just, familiar with what the conversation was last year, that I wouldn't want this to take over the retreat. I think that the retreat should be very specific about how we're operating and to add this to the retreat will take uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of time out. Uh, we had already come up with a plan with Nick, the consultant that is helping us. So to bring this into it, I, I think, I, I see this more of a, you know, a decision that we, we can make based on on the merits, I don't want to be the first one. I'm going to wait to to speak, but I'm just talking specifically at the retreat part. Uh, so, Diane. So, so then I guess as I mean, I have a a certain feeling just from my interactions with the VSBA in previous years, and so to better understand what it would bring to my work here on this board, 
I guess I need to know what it is specifically they're offering to us for this um, and how we would. And so that was the only part of it that to me would come into play as part of the retreat, not that we discuss and re-debate how things were handled in the past. So if we have a sense of what are dues beyond what, you know, what's kind of generically there, um, I guess that's what my question is. Thank you, Diane. Um, uh, if I might just summarize, um, and then uh, Flora, correct me or anyone else, um, I think there is general agreement that the good stuff that does um, is worth it. The, um, the problem is not so much the VSBA's products as, um, as you heard from Ellen and Corinne, the, um, the nature of the representation and concern about the, um, I guess, you know, uh, since I can't think of a better word off the top of my head, the um, fidelity of representation. Um, does that subtract enough to make it not, not worthwhile? Or can we do something in order to shore that part up? Jill, sorry. Go ahead, Jill. Um, thanks. Can you guys hear me? Let me just. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, you know, I wasn't here for the for last year's debate, um, or for all of that. All of that ha came before and happened with Act Forty Six. Um, I will say I do have a, a bias toward associations because I, I do run one <laughs> and I have for my entire, <laughs> for much of my professional career, I've worked for trade associations. So uh, I definitely am inclined toward them. Um, I work in healthcare, so I have no real personal interaction with, with the VSBA. Uh, Scott, I found your summary really helpful in terms of understanding sort of both sides of the, of the debate. And honestly, as I've learned more and heard more, I, I think it's very fair criticism, in my view as an association leader myself, that the VSBA did not do a good job managing a diverse number of opinions around a really hot topic. It's very hard to run an association and come up with a position when you have members with diverse positions. That's the worst moment for any association leader is when they realize that they can't make all members happy we try to avoid issues like that to the greatest extent possible. And when they do come up, I think it's, it, it does take a fair amount of effort to, to manage them well. And from all the evidence I've seen, I don't think they did do so. There's one really important thing though, that's not on your summary, which is that their entire staff has, their, their main staff has turned over. There's new leadership in their executive director. That's huge. It's huge because the, the people who are on their board will come and go, but the, it's really the staff who do the everyday work that, that are important. So I think that's a, that's a missing piece to your summary in terms of what, what's different. And then the, the last thing I would say is that um, I'm a big fan of, <laughs> so I, I'm in favor of us rejoining the VSBA. But even if I wasn't, if I, was, if I fe felt sort of on the other side, just purely thinking tactically, I'm a keep your enemies closer kind of person. So I don't think we can influence the VSBA by not giving them $8,000. I think our voice in terms of what they do will be far more effective if we're in than if we're out. That is a purely tactical, practical way that I view this. Um, so, um, I don't think not having a voice is really going to help. I, I just I just don't think it will change things. And the other thing is it means that when we need to look for outside resources and we want to see what are other schools doing, how are things working across Vermont, we'll be relying on the Superintendents Association, Principals Association, the NEA. Those are all really important groups. None of them represent school boards. So they will not be looking at those issues through our lens and that will be our source of information. So I don't, I see little value and little impact of not joining. I see value in joining and I would strongly, I'm strongly in favor of joining. 
I also don't think we should have a huge to do about this. So I'm <laughs> not going to say any more, but I, I wanted to sort of lay out my position and, um, and I'm glad to hear from others. Thank you, Jill. Uh, so keeping your enemies close, I hope that's not why you joined the board. Clo closer, you keep your friends close and closer. your enemies closer. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, Jonas, then Chris McVeigh, then Caroline. Uh, so I want to echo what, what Jill said about not making a big to do about it. Um, you know, um, I want to thank Scott, you know, uh, again for putting the, uh, you know, the, the points together. I thought it was even handed, uh, and extremely fair. Uh, I, I think it, that did a service to this conversation. Um, I also will second what's been said that, um, you know, you know, the, on the surface, it did not feel last year that we missed a whole lot from VSBA. Um, ha, you know, having said that, I'm not sure what other districts got from them, right? So having not been a member, I'm not sure what we missed out on. Um, and I will, you know, and for the, the main point of what I want to say is, you know, distinct from the organizational benefits to this board, um, you know, I missed last year and I miss now and have missed over the summer. Um, having an organization that I could speak to um, about my own particular concerns about being a school board member, um, to have someone to talk to um, you know, who represents school boards, who I could bounce ideas off of, um, sort of you know, both in terms of you know, district operation and you know, the sort of tactics of how these things go here. Um, I missed having that resource, um, and I would, you know, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand with Jill and strongly uh, support uh, rejoining the VSBA. Um, you know, if for nothing else than to to give me and the rest of us um, a, yet another resource um, to be able to speak to. I don't think. As I said last year, I see no benefit to our students. I don't think it advances the cause of education in our district to not be a member. Thanks, Jonas. Um, Chris McVeigh, please. Um, hi, everyone. So um, I voted against um, renewing the VSBA um, uh, dues last year. Uh, and um, what I don't know when they're due this year. It looks like 60 days from the date of the invoice. So it's not something that needs to be rushed because it, it's a 60 days term, which means to me that we have 60 days to make this decision and to pay the dues. Um, and uh, I, I certainly appreciate the comments, public comments on how well the policy committee did. Uh, and would love to say, yes, we. Uh, you know, created all of these original policies, but that just wouldn't be true um, because a lot of the policies that we worked with were ones that had been developed through the VSBA and were model policies uh, that we had already had because as you recall, we kind of re-initiated, um, reviewed, tweaked some policies, created some new ones that were not part of the VSBA um, canon, uh, but the VSBA, um, and again, this is not advocating for them, but just clarifying the facts of the policies that we did work with and a lot of them were VSBA model policies. Uh, so I just wanted to put that on the table in terms of um, uh, a candor for facts. Um, what what I, I, I am still, and I don't know if anyone in this, on the board can speak to this, but the letter from uh, Neil um, Scott Odell uh, was that um, they had added a section to the strategic planning uh, division um, and forming a member member engagement committee. Um, I have no idea what that means. Is anybody here from the VSBA uh, who can speak to that and what that what that means? Because it almost seems like this is a selling point that there that Neil has uh, included into the uh, his letter um, enlisting our, our support and our membership again. Uh, the other thing that I would point out um, is that the you know the VSBA will speak for school boards, um, but we don't necessarily want to have that singular voice. I don't think um, the and and I, and I my understanding is that um, board members for the VSBA 
um, are required to sign uh, some type of pledge that they will not speak. I see people are shaking their head a little bit, but I, but I think I read this in their materials and I certainly heard it from uh, Dorothy Naylor's uh, daughter, who is a member of the board, that they have to sign some type of pledge not to speak ill of the VSBA, uh, which that's troublesome to me um, to say that you cannot, as a board member, you can't speak contrary to the interests of the organization. Um, and, and that doesn't sound like a very open and, um, and um, seeking to have robust discussion amongst board members if you're required not to speak against the interests of the, of the organization. Um, so with that, I would, I would um, the other thing I, I would bring up is um, whether we can pay over time so that uh, if we really haven't heard from the VSBA about um, amending ways, um, paying over time is, is a way to uh, keep a uh, fingers on the pulse of what we may or may want, what we want to hear from them. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm happy to entertain questions. I may be wrong about anything that I've said here, um, as opposed to my opinions. Um, but if there are any fact errors, I'd, I'd be glad to have them pointed out. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, Caroline? How perfect that I'm going after Chris just said if there's any fact errors. Um, nothing with what you said, Chris. But when I read the report, now the board packet having that piece for me as a new board member it was my first time, you know, reading about this issue. Um, it had come up back when I was on the board before, but we hadn't, um, I had, I'd missed the last year of discussion. So that document was the first thing I saw. I felt it was pretty clear that the author um, was opposed to joining. So I have a little difference of opinion with people who felt it was helpful. I, I felt it was slightly biased um, for one saying that the decision is about payment. I see the decision being about membership. Um, and I think that's an important distinction because if we were talking budget and um, paying, that to me has a different feel. And if we're talking about we value membership, we feel that we need membership. Um, there was a piece in it that talked about the conflict of interest, specifically sharing an office space with the Vermont Superintendents Association. That to me is pretty misleading. An office, shared office space. Um, what I currently have with my husband and we share an office and we share that space. They share an office building um, is my understanding. And there are six tenants in that building, the um, Vermont Principals Association, the Vermont Superintendents Association and, and others. Um, so it, it's not like they are overhearing people's discussion or influencing each other. Um, I agree with Jill on the new um, executive director is a huge deal. And um, so that would be one of my points. And then last one I'll make is just that I think the biggest issue right now is COVID. And, and I believe being part of the VSVA is going to help guide us in what's needed, both what we know of right now that we need and what we're going to find out we need once students are back in the building and having any assistance or direction on that would be helpful. Um, I know that through that since March, the VSBA has given some non-members some direction. It doesn't mean that they always will continue to do that. And so for me, COVID is the biggest issue right now. And that's why I would be in support of remaining a member. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Chris, I see your hand up. Is that from last time? Okay. It, well, so it, it is, but I'd like if I'd like to speak again after everybody else has had a turn. Okay, we'll come back to you. I see Lindy is there. Lindy. I can never get unmuted on my iPad. Sorry about that. Um, I really appreciate the view that Jill gave and 
as a person who feels like the VSBA did not penalize us in a way when we didn't pay last year because we did get some of their information um, and it was available. And when COVID came, I, I, am, I was one who was in favor of remaining and whether it's 60 days or 90 days or 30 days, I don't want this uh, pushed off kind of like Jonas not making a big deal. Let's just make a decision and um, vote yay or nay. And being a part of the organization is important to me as a board member. The training they did was excellent. Uh, I value their representation. And um, I just, I think that it's something that's important to be a part of. And I would not like to make a big deal out of it as far as dragging it on and continuing. Thanks, Lindy. Um, Kari, did I, did I briefly see your hand up? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so um, I'll just go, I'll try to be brief. Um, Scott, you asked about interests. My primary interest is about development. Um, I think advocacy is important, but um, I really feel like the, the role of the board is so complex and very few of us are, are experts at being school board directors. So we really have to be thinking about how we can get better individually and collectively. If we're not doing that, um, we're, we're not doing our jobs in, in, in a sense. And so um, while there are other resources out there for board development, I feel like VSBA is one of our best. And so for example, the um, webinars that they do, the conference, the network really of, of it's our peers across the state. Um, I think these are all really important. And I also um, make a plug for their orientation, um, the essential work of, of school boards. I, th I found very important um, for getting started as a, a new school board director. So um, based on that interest, that, that, that's why I'm in support of, of renewing, rejoining. Thank you very much, Kai. Um, have, we, have we reached a natural pause in the, oh, Dorothy. Yeah, um, I've been listening to, to all of this. Um, one thing that Kari just said that caught my ear was he, saw, um, he said, this is one of our best um, board supports. I think it's the only one in Vermont. Um, so it, I guess it's the best. I just have a real problem with, um, I'm looking at it from the money standpoint. I know it's not a lot of money, but I actually, I have lost trust in the VSBA. I felt that I'm, I'm trying not to use a lot of comments that I could use. I just do not trust them. And I find it very difficult to vote to spend our my taxpayers money for something that play a place that I do not trust. I know there's new management and I understand what Jill had to say, um, but I cannot support um, this when there is a motion to pay this bill. I would go along, I might go along with Chris's suggestion to pay it in quarters, um, but I, I am not comfortable uh, nothing big has happened. I don't think that, I, I think they did understand that we didn't, why we didn't pay uh, or join the membership and pay the dues. But I think it needs to go on a little while longer for them to know that, yeah, we really meant this. So that's where I am right now. Thank you. Thanks, Dorothy. And Chris, my apologies, and then Floor. I'm, I'm, I'm going to yield to Floor first, because I don't think she's spoken to this issue yet. No, that's that's correct. Floor. Okay, so I, I have a, obviously a couple of things to say, but first, I, because there were some questions first from Diane and then from from, from Chris, my day. So, so one, uh, I think that would be important for us to just remember is that the, I'm gonna just read the, the mission because the vision is a little bit bigger of the, of the VSBA. 
The VSBA exists to achieve Vermont's vision for public education by supporting all school boards to serve as effective trustees of education in behalf of their communities and by providing a strong collective voice towards enhance, enhancing the cost of public education in Vermont. So to, you know, I, I don't see how we wouldn't want to be part of that conversation in, in a broader, uh, you know, support all of our other districts because at the end we're all together in Vermont with this. And the other thing that I would say is that Vermont plays a big role at national level, not a big role, but in the past we have tried to have a better, uh, a better voice. So we're divided into regions too. So the New England region is really important. So we would be separating ourselves from being able to help our neighbors in other states. And Vermont has a really good voice in public education. And I feel like it's selfish from ourselves to remove ourselves from, from that conversation. Then there is no pledge. I, there is no pledge that is signed. We have never signed a pledge. I was in the VSBA to be clear. So that's what I was trying to be last in the conversation. So I was that person that Ellen was talking about that was sitting there as in any meeting that we all have. If you have three people vote no, but the yes have it, the eyes have it, as an organization, you go with the majority of your board and that is your job as a board member. So, so it, is, it, is, it is hard. The other thing that I would say is that we as a board do not appoint a member. The regional, are, are, they are elected and the election for, if we wanna be part of the conversation, the election for the member for Washington uh, Central would be not is just not us is Washington and Orange and now is Washington and Omoyo is it would be uh, in October first. So if we want to have a vote of who represents us, it would be nice to be able to approve this so we have a voice and it's elected. So when I was elected, I was not elected just by you guys. We were elected by by um, by the whole Washington and Orange. So includes Montpelier, includes the. Uh, all of the orange schools. So it's not like uh, we appoint somebody. And then the last thing that I, uh, that I was, so I said already, not, there's no pledge. And then the regarding the, I, I have not been part of the conversation right now on on setting that, that committee, but to more specific on, uh, hold on a minute. Uh, I did ask that, that question on, on the committee. So the committee was created basically to try to uh, get more people, uh, try to have a better grip on how our members were feeling, how they were getting in, engaged. So it's, it's just in this, that, so it's a member engagement committee was formed to work on member outreach and ways that we can improve our relationship with our members. So that's what, what that was the answer that I got from, uh, uh, from, from them. So I don't know if that helps with the, with the decisions. I would be obviously in, in favor mostly because I think we play an important role in, uh, in, um, in the ed public education conversation in this state. And we learn a lot from our neighbors. Chris. Um, so certain two, two um, points. One is that Sue uh, Siglowski is now the executive director um, but she's not brand new. Um, she's been a member of the staff for years, I believe. Um, so it's not a new executive director um, outside the organization. Um, it's someone who's been in the organization um, for a number of years, as far as I know. Uh, second is uh, we don't have to be members to um, access the resources that the VSBA has. My understanding is that there's, you can um, purchase various resources from them on a standalone item, on a standalone basis that you don't have to be a member in order to um, access any of the VSB, VSBA resources. Uh, they, they basically sell them. So, you know, there's, there's not a, um, it's not an all or nothing proposition, either a full member of the VSBA um, or you can't um, access the resources because um, they sell, I think they sell them as standalone, standalone items, kind of like an a la carte, as opposed to buying the entire feast. Um, so uh, those are the final two points. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, if, if no 
other board members are interested in um, the oh, Lynn. Um, I just wanted to respond, <clears throat> excuse me, to Chris in the sense of the a la carte idea. I think we spend our thousand dollars pretty quickly if we were parting items from them. If we feel their items are important to us, we should be members and access them through that. Thank you, Lindy. Um, Lindy, the last time, since you're still open on your mic, last time you spoke before this, you mentioned it would be where to vote for um, the uh, paying dues. Would you mean to make a motion to that effect now? Make a motion that I'll vote for it or make a motion that we oh, don't no. vote? <laughs> <laughs> I make Approval a motion to that dues. we vote on whether on becoming members of the Vermont School Board Association. Is there a second? Scott, can I jump in here for a minute and offer uh, what might be a friendly amendment to Lindy's? Sure, Stephen. That the motion is that we join the Vermont School Boards Association. That's the motion. Elegant. Okay. That's Thank fine. you. Um, so, Jonas, did I take that as a second? Do you second the friendly? Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Now, um, if there's uh, further discussion, um, what we could do, because this is one of those issues that's, um, you know, it's just what it is. We could do a quick round um, to explain how you, what your vote means, or we could just vote. Any, Jonas? I suggest we just vote. Okay, very good. Um, any, uh, <laughs> I see Dorothy's thumb. Um, great, okay. Uh, so, all in favor of joining the VSBA as moved by Lindy and seconded by Jonas, please click yes. If you're opposed, for whatever reason, Click no. And I see a majority of yes. Um, uh, let me count the no's. One, two, three, four. And the yes is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Is that an accurate count? All right, very good. Thank you very much, Glenn. So the motion carries. Um, 3.3, ESP Act update. Uh, yes, I just have a quick update. I know that uh, uh, I was asked at the last board meeting regarding the, uh, the agreement, the, as of Friday, August 28th, 2020, the ESP agreement has been signed and it's now in effect. Uh, now we're doing the, uh, now what's happening is the human resources is updating all the ESP staff data to the new pay grid schedule. Uh, and that we're hoping to have that done by September 4th and start beginning processing and sending the ESP staff their contracts final, uh, final was signed by September 11th. Uh, we will have, uh, we'll have to change, we're doing a lot of work in our payroll department to make this work for the September 18th, 2020 payroll date. And then the back pay from September, from July 1st to September 4th will be recalculated. And our hope is to have this all set and processed by October 2nd. Uh, and so uh, so ultimately we're hoping that next week uh, from September 11th to September 16th, that staff will have their contracts in their school mailboxes. That's great. Um, do you have anything to add? Good. Um, board questions? Comments? Then we move well, to I'll, 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 Sorry, let, let me let me just comment. I'm Please. just I'm I'm very, very glad we were able to get this done. It was done under 
adverse circumstances, I'm, uh, you know, I don't see Becky or, um, or anyone else from, uh, from that negotiating group uh, on the call. But, you know, for the record, I want to thank them for working with us uh, openly and in good faith. And uh, I think it bodes really well for the conversations we'll have later in the year. And, and can I just also piggyback off what Jonas said, uh, and also to go back and do all this work right at the start of the year, I just want to give Carla Messier and uh, Virginia, our payroll, our, should give them the uh, mad, uh, mad props, as we say. And, uh, so uh, they definitely did, uh, they're definitely working uh, very hard to make sure this payroll is all uh, ac accurately counted. Wonderful. Very happy to hear it. <laughs> Thanks to both of them. Um, they also made it possible, including the negotiations committee. Um, so, uh, point four, schedule negotiation committee. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll, speak, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to this. Um, uh, Stephen and uh, I think it's Diane, because Lindy, I don't think you wanted to touch that anymore. Um, but I would love an opportunity to get together and talk with you guys. And since we're a committee, uh, it has to be formal. So I'd love to find a time to get together with Brian, um, you know, and anyone else, uh, you know, from, from uh, Brian's team that he thinks uh, should be in that meeting. Uh, talk about, um, you know, how these, how those agreements and how the conversations we had with them uh, last year, um, you know, impact this year uh, and how we should approach the negotiations and approach our, our work with our uh, union colleagues. So uh, there's nothing pressing. Um, I just, sort of like to get to the conversation sooner rather than later. Uh, Jonas, I just want to make sure. Uh, so I have Stephen, Diane, you, uh, me, my t members of my team on it. Uh, I just, uh, what is your expectation to uh, have this meeting? Uh, is it towards the later in the month of September? Uh, is it, wh where are you uh, thinking? I mean, I think anytime after the uh, retreat, you know, I think okay. if, we, if we could find an hour, you know, sometime, you know, again, I don't, I don't think it's urgent, but. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks, and um, this, um, this discussion me that we have a new board member, Caroline, um, that you haven't had a chance um, by barely drink your water alone to get a, a committee amendment. Um, this is just sort of a parenthesis if you're thinking about what committee appeals to you, I think you would be welcome on any one of them, not refused from any, uh, if I'm not overstepping and saying so. So um, keep that in mind, please. Great. We'd be happy to have you. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out for negotiations. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. <clears throat> okay, so uh, anything further on 3.4 scheduling negotiations committee? No, not at all. I think we can take care of that by email. I just wanted to uh, have that just, I just wanted to say that in, in open session. Super. Great. Thanks, Jonas. Brian. So okay. um, let's move on to 4.11 school opening update. Uh, there's material on page five of the package. Brian, you want to take this? Uh, yes, I have a rather lengthy uh, school reopening update today. Uh, so, my, uh, I mean, I, I know we've had every week we're reading, but this is uh, the, the big one before the uh, uh, opening of school. Uh, just first of all, I just uh, want to welcome Caroline, our newest school board member. I'm looking forward to working with you, Caroline, uh, uh, in the future. Uh, the uh, We begin this week. Uh, it was, uh, we, we've had a, a very, uh, it's hard to say very good uh, because of the circumstances that happened earlier in the week. Uh, there was a lot of energy last week, a lot of high energy. Uh, we had a, uh, we, we drive into work on Monday morning and it, it, it was a, a very a difficult situation for a school community uh, with what happened uh, uh, to Nate and, and, and the Romney uh, school community in particular. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, really uh, thank Kelly Bushy and Jen Miller Arsenault uh, uh, for their leadership and really uh, just jumping into it right away and going to the school and working with Casey Provost, the principal. And I wanna thank him for his leadership. And uh, I know it's a very difficult time for the teachers and school community over there. 
uh, but I, I was uh, just very thoroughly impressed with uh, with them and how much our, our uh, staff care about each other. And, uh, and I thought that was just something very, very special and worth noticing uh, mentioning tonight at tonight's board meeting. Uh, I also want to uh, thank uh, board chair Scott Thompson uh, and vice chair Flor Diaz Smith uh, for supporting me uh, in my professional growth. I uh, want this school board has made an investment in me as your superintendent. And uh, I, I am a member of the VSA Superintendent Leadership Academy. And last Monday, I was uh, one of my professional development sessions uh, was uh, which was the VSA in conjunction with the VSBA uh, held a superintendent board relations uh, professional development with uh, myself and the board chair and vice chair. And I just thank them for taking up uh, several hours out of their day or out of their evening to be with me uh, to uh, go through that journey together. Uh, and those are just uh, you know some things that I, I didn't have uh, you know written the memos or anything, but I just thought. Uh, it was important to add that uh, to the, tonight's packet. I have a, a lot of things to talk about tonight. The first thing is I and I did receive the education legislative report. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, if you've heard about this before, but uh, the legislative uh, session did uh, return. Uh, the General Assembly returned on August 25th with the primary goal of completing the budget for fiscal year 2021. Uh, while lawmakers have returned to bills that have been under consideration, uh, they, uh, the, the, both the leaders of the House and Senate have stressed that as soon as the state budget is complete, they will adjourn. And the timeline for this session is anticipated to conclude by September 25th or sooner. So one of the first things that they've tackled is education funding. Uh, the committees on Senate Finance and Senate Education held a joint hearing on education funding on their first day back. Mark Perrault from Joint Fiscal Office presented an update on the educational fund showing a decrease, and this is some good news, a decrease in the anticipated ed fund shortfall to $66.4 million. So this number has been going down, so that's a, a, good, a good sign. I keep uh, reminding my, my wife uh, when we, when we, we uh, decide, are we going to cook or eat, eat out tonight? We, we, we've been opting to eat out so we can support the Vermont economy. Uh, when we go out and uh, go to the restaurants uh, locally. Um, the VSBA and VSA, VSA also uh, did present joint testimony on three legislative tasks. And I thought these were worth mentioning because they could impact us or not, we'll see. Uh, but the first one was a reduction in required student days from 175 to 170. Uh, the second thing is Protection of the General Assembly's stated plan for $100 million, which was fenced off for K-12 education. And uh, an amendment to 16 VSA 4010 to establish a one-year hold harmless protection against declines in equalized pupils in order to stabilize budget development for fiscal year 2022. Uh, and then I, the VSBA and the VSA also testified before the House Education Committee with the same joint testimony they presented earlier in the week to the Senate Finance and Education Committees. Uh, the, I'm trying to give you the highlights of everything that's been going on uh, with the legislative report. Additional things uh, that the Agency of Education expects to have more accurate reports on costs to the school districts uh, in both fiscal year 20 and 21 within the next couple weeks with regards to the coronavirus and how that's been impacting uh, school districts across the state of Vermont. So uh, that'll be something to look uh, look forward to uh, in the weeks ahead. Uh, they also, again, um, uh, the VSBA, VSA, VPA, VS, VCSEA, and VASBO have also been working together with the with the to, to uh, provide testimony related to uh, these these three things, the three points I just provided earlier. Uh, with regards to uh, reopening of schools. The additional observations that were presented to the Senate Education Committee included uh, the uh, in th three points, ineligibility of federal COVID-19 relief funding of three technical center school districts, uh, anticipated revenue shortfalls in districts accustomed to receiving tuition revenues, 
in, in choice districts in Vermont. And, and here's the one that I, I thought was interesting because we've been talking a lot about it here in our district. Insufficient funding support for the program created to address ventilation and air filtration systems, which has generated a great deal of interest and participation by school districts seeking to improve those systems in support of safer school environment. Committee to discussion included an update on the HVAC program being managed through Efficiency Vermont. The total amount needed to, HVAC, to address the HVAC in public schools as a mitigation measure for COVID-19 is, is estimated to be in a range of between 12 to $18 million across the state of Vermont. Uh, and the current uh, allocation for this work is $6.5 million. Uh, so uh, that's something just we're, we're definitely watching. Uh, the, uh, according to the House Committee on Ways and Means, uh, and on August 28th, uh, they, uh, they, they uh, let the General Assembly and uh, went public and said that it's the intent of the General Assembly to address deficits that Vermont faces through several strategies, the first being the using federal funds to the greatest extent possible. Um, they also uh, reported that the number of students applying for homeschooling across the state of Vermont has increased from 932 in 2019, 2020, to 1,634 as of July 2020. This causes concern for education funding due to Vermont's unique funding structure, which is affected by student counts done during the census period in the fall. Uh, there is a, a major discussion and debate going on in the General Assembly regarding this matter. Uh, and uh, I think the sentence sums it up. While some members of the committees expressed the need to provide school districts with ADM stability, as school leaders approach budget development season, others prefer to take no action until the next biennium in January. So uh, that's definitely gonna have a major impact on, I think, budget budgeting. Uh, and hopefully we'll have some information about whether we'll, how they'll take up these uh, recommendations from our uh, associations uh, and uh, hopefully from our legislative uh, folks that represent our school districts and uh, communities uh, outside of this organization, this group. There are some, uh, again, the uh, Secretary uh, French also uh, met with the Senate Education uh, on uh, August 27th and he, proposed four proposals as well. Uh, some of them are aligned with the other, other proposals. Uh, the first one was reducing the uh, number of student days from 175 to 170 and increase the number of teacher in service days from five to 10. I'm very proud of um, the work that um, our school district has done with front loading 10 days right in the beginning of the year in this contract, uh, in, in this uh, calendar year. And I'm also very uh, pleased with the work that Jen Miller Arsenault has done uh, with regards um, uh, to helping work with our teachers and, and, and principals in planning this professional development uh, th through these last, as of Friday, there'll be 10 days. Uh, Secretary French is also asking for statutory language modification uh, for the 2020-21 school year to require the secretary to determine ADM for each school district at a count no lesser than the district's 2019-2020 ADM. Uh, number three, enact a waiver amending the duties and powers of the standards board for professional educators so that during the 21-2022 school year, no teacher would be required to hold an endorsement for online teaching uh, in order to teach online or implement remote learning. Uh, so right now, that's a big one for us. Uh, we currently have six teachers, uh, plus our special ed, uh, special ed teachers and seven teachers uh, who are, have been identified for remote learning. And uh, part of the uh, thing is we have to, as of the current rules, if this does not change, we would have to uh, make sure that these folks get their online teaching endorsement. Um, so this would be a waiver of that. So that would be very helpful. Uh, and then of course, uh, this one is the uh, last one that from Secretary French provide a statutory language modification to require all school district meetings held during the 2020-21 school year to be conducted through the use of Australian ballot. Uh, and that, uh, and of course, uh, and I think those were most of the, uh, uh, there were some other updates. There's always updates from the legislative. One other thing just worth mentioning, broadband connectivity. 
Uh, the Department of Public Service reported on data collected from school districts regarding student residences and access to broadband internet. Uh, one round of grant work has been done and the department is preparing for a second round um, throughout the state of Vermont with regards to broadband uh, connectivity. And those were, that is the education legislative report. So there's a lot of things happening that will, I think, shape our school year moving forward uh, and the future. Uh, and it's all gonna play out between now and September 25th, it looks like. Wow, that's a lot indeed. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Um, questions, board members, for Brian? I'm gonna go through. No, just thank you. I guess not. <laughs> uh, Jonas. Are these okay? questions ju just about the legislative report? <clears throat> No. Okay, Chris. Um, uh, Brian, you mentioned about the the. It seems like there's a shortfall between um, the anticipated uh, money needed for the ventilation across the state, which they estimate between 12 and 18 million, and what has currently been allocated at 6.5 million. Um, and we have committed ourselves to already doing that upgrade on work. So does that raise a potential? shortfall for us as a uh, that is a great question i have I, I can i can i'm gonna ask Lori to chime in here on this uh but what i can tell you is uh you know, we've submitted our application to uh, efficiency vermont we're waiting i mean that's why you know you get an email saying yes we think you can do it and now we're just waiting so uh Lori, do you have any inf other additional information I, I think chris asked a great question Really received word tonight um, to resubmit our budget for the grand total of 492,000, which is what we were hoping for. Um, so the only project that didn't qualify at this time is the central office because this, this particular funding source is purely for air quality. So the good news is everything that we just approved has been submitted. And as far as I can tell, unless they run out of money, um, we are eligible for everything. If they run out of money today, I just submitted again to a different grant, um, the full amount as a precaution. Uh, I don't want to call it double dipping, but it's an opportunity that if one funding source doesn't have enough money, the other one does. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any other or any other questions for segment of Brian's report before we all forget what it is that he said. Okay, um, Brian, do you want to continue then? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, the other, the next step, uh, thing is for full transparency. Uh, it's been a, a hot topic amongst me and my members of uh, the leadership team is the elementary remote teaching update. Um, so I know uh, we have, we have uh, I want to just uh, give a shout out to uh, Gillian uh, Fuqua, who is uh, going to help be the remote learning principal, helping out, uh, uh, and she's been working uh, with the students and she's been tracking the numbers. And I know, uh, you know, Gil, I've had really good conversations with a lot of different members of the leadership team about the numbers of students who are um, signed, who have signed up for the remote learning. And as we get closer to September 8th, those numbers are fluctuating. And so there are some, so the big thing was when we first began this, um, journey into remote learning at the elementary school, uh, offering this robust new, new, new system. Uh, the old, one of the ideas was to be cost neutral, right? We want to make sure we can use existing staff the best way possible. Uh, one uh, thing that has come up uh, is there are some great configurations where we're having a lot, a really high number of students. Uh, as of uh, August, 20, uh, about a week ago, we had 78 students. Now we've had some families change their mind. They have 84 students. Um, I think as of today, I think that number is even up to 88 students. So the number has been creeping up. Um, there's a, there, the numbers, as the numbers are getting higher in certain grade configurations, uh, the, the, the big conversations that you just want you to be completely aware and again, being transparent there are higher numbers in some of these configurations than what uh, our teachers are normally accustomed to, right? So uh, one class may, uh, may have 27, 28, even 29 students in it virtually. If you go, 
Uh, you can definitely ha see the kids in front of you on the small screens in the remote, but it is a lot more children than what folks are accustomed to. I did do some homework uh, and I did reach out throughout the uh, state of Vermont uh, and tried to look into what uh, other districts are doing across the state with regards to the class size of, um, of, our, of school of, of remote learning. So the information I have currently is uh, many districts are not capping the remote size classes. Uh, there are also many districts are attempting to mirror what is possible in their in-person classes. However, these districts that responded to my inquiry were mainly offering hybrid. So if the idea if you have 15 kids in your class on Monday and Tuesday, and then you have a day off on Wednesday to do cleaning, and then Thursday and Friday you're remote, you have the same 15 kids. So that it's easy for them to, there's a mirroring of that. Uh, there was one district that did get back to me that is a, that ha is, has a similar model that we have. Uh, and they said that a district that is similar to the options we are providing stated they're offering a cap of 30 for remote classes and we're considering getting additional teacher support or para support or, uh, if, and if, the, if that 30 number is achieved. Now, I do know that we have, I think one of the configurations that has 29 uh, and that could change tomorrow and we could have more. Um, but what complicates this, the situation is in my conversations with Secretary French, um, he, uh, Vermont, he is, I've learned that Vermont is seriously considering moving towards step three, as long as the numbers look good uh, with the uh, metrics that they're looking at, uh, which may prompt discussions across the state of Vermont for not having remote offerings at all in the state. And this could happen a few weeks from now, a few months from now, or maybe never, it doesn't happen this year. Um, there is also no class size statute in the state of Vermont. Uh, so this is, uh, I think, a, um, something that uh, I, members of my leadership team and, and I have to, this, had discussions, folks have, are, are uh, definitely th thinking that we need to uh, get new, more teachers. We need to think about hiring new teachers. That's one, that's one camp of th thought. Uh, my thought, my thinking of it is that may be something we may have to do uh, but I would really like some time to look at class sizes in our district uh, across the board and also uh, make a more informed decision about these, some of these classes uh, when we actually know what happens when school reopens. Uh, you know, it's kind of like that. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge, right? Do you, do you assume that you're going to get more numbers and the numbers are going to keep going up? Or, and do you really want, or do you want to wait a few weeks and see how this plays out. And so I think, uh, I think right now, this is something that we're monitoring um, and we may have to see what, what we have to do as we get a little further into the school year. Thanks, Brian. Um, Dorothy, yes. I just wanted to ask, um, in remote, can they also do what a lot of schools have been doing in school in the past um, and have mixed grades. In other words, that, that a bunch of kids could be shuffled around amongst two other teachers. And that, that's yeah. Just, fine. Yeah, so, so thank you, Dorothy. Yeah, so we're looking, uh, uh, our team has looked at the grade configurations. Uh, we have uh, right now that the two grade configurations that actually have the, we are doing the, the multi-grades. So we do have grades three and four there. They have a higher high number and grades five and six has a high number. Uh, as of right now, and that could, of course, at what point does it get to a point where like, well, so right now I'm hearing, Brian, you know, our teachers aren't used to having that many kids in a class, and I, and, and I, and I understand that, uh, and I'm trying to be uh, sensitive to that, uh, and then at the same time, uh, I know they're not, you know, you don't have to worry about bathroom breaks, you don't have to worry about, <laughs> I mean, you see everyone on the screen, it's a little different, but there is still a lot of work to be done with in remote in a remote setting for the teacher. So I don't want to denigrate their work or saying, but I, it, it's it's a, it's just one of those tough you know head scratching things. What do you do? Um, and you know, be, trying to be respectful to the teachers and uh, the families. Uh, but I mean, obviously, we don't want to get you know so many kids in there that you know you have little you can't even see the faces on the screen. You know, I have right now. I have I can see everyone right now. I have twenty five here uh, faces on my screen on Zoom. Zoom, but uh, I guess it would get a lot smaller if I added it up to uh, its full capacity 
of 49. That, that would be uh, uh, very different. But of course, it comes down to you know, dollars and cents and, you know, where do we, you know, are we going to spend this money? I know that uh, we've been, I know Lori and I have been looking at uh, different uh, opportunities to see if we need to fund or if we can use some uh, interesting ways of funding additional teaching staff. Uh, but I don't want to commit to anything right now uh, until we have a better idea of how this plays out. Thanks, Brian. Stephen Luke. Um, I'll speak for myself as a board member. I think Brian's proposal that we wait a couple weeks into the school year to see how everything pans out and class size pans out is prudent, is a good suggestion. And uh, I'm very comfortable with that. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Chris McVeigh, and then Jonas. Um, I, I think we should grapple with the um, question of whether um, if we're offering remote um, to families that we offer it for the entire year and not have it withdrawn um, by a move to phase three. Um, and I think that's something we should grapple with and, and come to a decision on as a board um, because I think uh, and based on the numbers going from 78, um, I think Brian said up to potentially 88 today, um, it shows a concern among some of our families about going back into the classroom. And um, I suspect that that concern is not removed simply because the governor says we can go to phase three. Uh, and if we start with that and we configured a, what sounds like wants to be renamed a separate school um, as the remote campus, uh, maybe it's the Mars school, um, but we, um, we should honor that. Um, I think if we start out, we start out with it, we should honor it for the, the course of the school year. And I think we should come to that conclusion or decision as a board so that, so that our families can, can depend on it. Um, and then second point um, for, for Brian uh, is, uh, Brian, in terms of if the remote classes get large enough, um, is there a way of using the teachers that we already have on staff to teach the, um, the, the flow? The overflow that way, rather than hire hire a new remote teacher. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, that that's the question that I'm grappling with, Chris, uh, and I think that's why uh, I'm asking. Uh, to, uh, to, I'm, I'm trying to uh, have everyone to say, let's put a pause and let's see how this plays out in the next few weeks. I do also. I also am aware of uh, that the uh, policy uh, committee and the board passed a class size policy uh, last year and. This could be a perfect time to provide that information to the board in a future meeting about the class sizes in our schools, and also to you know, look at look at that because that could be something, Chris. But uh, I don't want to jump make that because uh, in my conversations with my initial review of the initial seventy eight children, uh, they were kind of evenly distributed. Uh, it was very interesting across the. So you don't really, yeah, I, I, I haven't seen a class that's down to like two kids and a full-time teacher in the inset. I haven't seen that. Obviously that would be something to, to look at, uh, but uh, right now um, I haven't seen it, but that could change. Again, it's, you know, we gained 10 kids in the last just few days and we still have a few days to go. I do think that uh, after school starts, we shouldn't let kids, we, we should probably stop that from going in. Uh, but however, the other piece that the other piece that is, is to support our teachers, um, I had and I made this publicly known. So, uh, if you have a child who refuses to wear a mask and doesn't and doesn't want to comply, obviously we're just just progressive ways to go about and try to find out why is the child not wearing the mask, what's going on. But at some point, I have to be prepared as superintendent to uh, let the family know that their child's going to be going to remote learning, which could also increase the size uh, the the, uh, the class sizes of these. Uh, so this is kind of a a very dynamic, complicated. Um, matter, but it's a great, that's, that's exactly what I've been, I've been definitely grappling with that. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Jonas. Thanks, Scott. Um, I have a, just a couple of comments to make. I want to mention uh, a story in VT Digger from a few days ago uh, that quoted a teacher from our district uh, saying how unfortunate it was uh, that we couldn't come up with a statewide plan for reopening schools. Um, I have to sort of second that, uh, that sentiment. Um, the article was about the difficulty teachers are going to have um, and the state setting up childcare hubs. Uh, one thing that I thought was um, uh, uh, a little disappointing was that the article did not mention the extraordinary uh, uh, 
uh, efforts and plans that uh, that we have made uh, to you know to offer enrollment to the children of our teachers uh, to provide the places in schools or you know we were way out ahead on the hubs. Um, I voted against those uh, uh, those decisions. Um, I'm still, you know, really uncomfortable with that, but um, I do think that credit needs to be given to uh, the board and the district for uh, for having that in mind uh, and coming up with what I hope will be uh, really good plans. Um, about uh, the remote, uh, rem uh, about the remote uh, uh, cohort, um, Brian. Uh, just a point of clarification: Did I hear you say that at some point um, we're not going to allow uh, families to move from in-person to remote or from remote to in-person? Uh, uh, yes, you did. I can clarify that. Um, the, uh, the idea is at some point we, we are going to have to have some sort of cap or, or some sort of, uh, yeah, we, the, 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 what the, some of the folks in our leadership team and I have discussed is if we have, uh, if we can, if we have provide opportunities for families to switch, into remote or not, that may have to happen at the quarters or semester mark. So we give people an opportunity, but at some point we do have to set a, uh, you know, a, a, a time to say, we've given, I mean, we already kind of set a deadline already, but we've been allowing folks to, as we get closer to the school year, uh, because they're, they're, they're getting, they have more information. They, you know, I think about, a, about two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, we set a deadline saying, this is when the deadline is. However, uh, we've allowed up to at least 10 parents and families already to come in because, you know, it's probably the right thing to do at this point. But uh, I do know that I did talk to some other districts, even close, close to us, that says at some point you have to uh, stop it because you're going to, you have plans in place and it's going to be almost virtually impossible if you just have folks coming in and out of uh, these classes. I, I hear that, um, you know, the, the one thing that sort of gives me pause about that um, is, um, you know, that there, there may be an exogenous event coming, right, which is, an, a, you know, a new wave of infections. And at that point, if people are afraid, you know, and, you know, who knows what that threshold is going to be, um, you know, I would certainly, you know, I would hope that as a district, we are, you know, we're acting with as much compassion and understanding as we can for, for families who, you know, may be very worried about their health, the health of their children, uh, you know, and the health, you know, public health in general, um, and trying to minimize the risk of, of additional spread at all. Um, I also, you know, just one more thing before I stop monopolizing the time. Um, you know, you said that the number of, uh, of kids who will be going remote has, has been ticking up. Um, you know, that may go the other way at some point, right? And, you know, are you at all concerned that, um, you know, families, you know, at some point who decide to send their kids back to in-person, that that may create, you know, unsafe numbers of kids in rooms in schools? No, no. Uh, as, it, as it currently, no, but that we, we would definitely monitor it. I do know that uh, we have had some families move into our school district, uh, within the last week. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if it's a population boom at this point, but I, I do know that we can safe, safely so, be socially distant uh, uh, currently on, if the kids did, because it's been evenly distributed across the, uh, across the uh, district currently. Again, I still don't, I can't, um, you know, I don't know what that'll look like in a week from now, right now, but the, as of right now, that's how I understand it. Okay. Uh, sorry, Scott, can I ask one more question? And then I will promise to stop talking. Go right ahead, Janice, please. Um, thank you. Um, so, you know, these are really just tough decisions, and um, you know, you know, a, a lot of this seems to be really on a nice edge, right? Which is totally understandable. I don't think there's any way around that. Um, you know, I've been, you know, as a, as a consumer of news, um, you know, I've been really concerned about what I've been seeing in New York, you know, and in, you know, I think it was in Andover, Massachusetts, where. You know, uh, you know, labor actions are either you know happening or or being taken, um, and you know, as you know, as decisions get made about how the schools operate and where you know, you know how you know the responsibilities are divided up between classrooms and you know who's working remote, who's working in person, who's working where. Um, you know, I you know, I guess you know, I guess this isn't a question, um, but you know, I. Um, you know, I would just urge, you know, everyone involved to be, you know, as collaborative and, and 
you know, keeping the teachers in mind as, as much as possible. You know, the teachers are going to make this happen. Um, and we're at, you know, we have, you know, since March, we have just asked so much of the educators in, in the district, um, you know, and from, you know, from, you know, this is, this is not a complaint, you know, from, from what I've seen and what we've heard in, in the meetings, um, you know, it, you know, it sounds like, you know, the, the teachers are a real partner in this and in all the planning and the conversations. Um, you know, I think that that's, I think that's uh, appropriate and I, um, look forward to seeing that continue. So I guess it wasn't a question, just more of a statement um, and more of an expression of support for the teachers and the administrators. So I can't understand, I can't imagine uh, the pressure they're under. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jonas. Um, Brian, I don't know if you wanted to say anything to that, Brian. Well, I, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, Jonas uh, hits, I think he hits the nail on the head there. Uh, I mean, the you know, the teachers, uh, and it's been a, it's been a, a, war, a major project with the you know the teachers on the task force, and uh, and I think the you know, my central office team, and I really think the principals, uh, the principals in our in our, our district are doing uh, such heroic work right now. Uh, they are doing something that's never been done before, uh, at least in a hundred years. Um, the, they've uh, they're doing something that schools weren't really built to do, right? I mean, so this is just a. Uh, you know, a historic moment, and you know, and, and in many ways, I, the the principals and the teachers here are, are my heroes in many ways, and I have to uh, just echo what you said, Jonas. Thank you, Brian. Um, any any more questions for for Brian on on this part? Uh, do you have do you have any anything further to? Yes, I do. I do. Okay. Uh, I, I, this is a big one. Uh, it, fell in our laps uh, yesterday and we've been dealing with it today. And so just full disclosure, uh, this was kind of like one of those like, oh, you know, wow, uh, this is a big one. Uh, so uh, and I sent, we're sending a letter out, this letter is going out to our families as well. And I shared this with our principals uh, and I've asked them each to come up with their own uh, ways of reaching out to their families to find out exactly um, how we can start determining how we're gonna order, get orders of food from, from our families. Uh, so let me give you an idea of what happened. So on August 31st, the US Department of Agriculture announced an extension of the summer meals program under which all children in the United States are now eligible for free meals. So, uh, so I see, I see uh, board member Goddard uh, put his thumbs up. So, uh, and uh, the extension will run through December 31st, 2020, or until funds allocated in this program have been depleted. So that's kind of like a, when is that depleted? Um, so that means that all families ch with children attending school in our district, whether they're doing in person or remotely, may take advantage of this program. So uh, this is a big shift to be f learning about three days before school opens. Um, between trying to figure out our food service delivery models to, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're, it's been a struggle just figuring out how to get the food from the cafeteria to the classroom to feed, to clean. To, and so now uh, uh, the next thing is making sure that uh, if everyone is gonna be getting free meals, does that change our numbers uh, of how many families are gonna get free meals or are gonna want free meals? And I think the numbers are gonna go up. Um, I know growing up, uh, uh, my parents uh, would tell me in, in the house that I was raised in, I know my dad would say, mom, mom and you, mom and I don't have to make you feel food for lunch. You're going to eat and you're getting free lunch. You're going, you know, and, and uh, so I, I just imagine that the numbers are going to go up. So, um, so that presents a lot of challenges for our food services. And so what we're trying to figure out right now is, um, how many families uh, communicate with our families at each school? How are we going to place orders for meals? Uh, and so uh, we're going to be asking. There's going to be a lot of work between just now and Friday just to get this get this done. And I I don't I don't know if we'll get get it perfect perfectly for the opening of school, but uh, we'll have a communication out to families uh, probably t definitely tomorrow. Uh, we'll ask, we're going to ask the parents uh, to complete continue to. Uh, um, be aware that this program exists uh, and they that they can still bring lunch from home if they wish, but we're gonna have to figure out how we do the ordering for it. So this is just a very 
new great opportunity. Don't get me wrong, but it's but the other problem is as of December 31st, do we go back to the old model on January 1st because it's the year ends or when the money when the money runs out. So we don't know when that happens. Another big thing that is uh, superintendents across the state of Vermont are grappling with is if everyone gets free free lunch, sounds great. Does that mean it's going to be is it going to, is it going to be more difficult to get families to fill out the free and reduced lunch applications anyway? Because if they're getting free lunch, do you get are you going to be and you were getting free lunch? Do you need to fill the application out anymore? And the problem with, and challenge that is associated with this is. Uh, we get Title I funds based on our uh, free and reduced lunch applications. So it's a very, it's a very tricky uh, situation that we're trying to deal with. And uh, I think we'll be managing this the rest of the week. And I think our principals uh, and food service folks will be, will, be, will be addressing this at least for the first two weeks of school to try to get this right. Thank you, Brian. That is a big one. Um, yeah. and many sided. Um, any questions for Brian on this piece? Jonathan? Yeah, Brian, I, I just had uh, just one question concerning whether the, the, the new USDA guidance speaks at all to those impacts potentially to Title I that you mentioned. Uh, no, not, not that. Great question, Jonathan. Uh, I had not received any, any information. Uh, all we got was this uh, letter from uh, based from our um, from the uh, from the FDA. But the, the I think the big thing is uh, we're expecting more information from uh, the AOE uh, in the maybe even as early as tomorrow. I know that in my weekly meeting tomorrow with Secretary French, people will be asking um, a lot of superintendents will be asking questions around just that. Thank you. And I know, uh, uh, I know, I know. I have Stephen here. I, I see Stephen. I don't know if uh, Stephen, you have anything else to add. I know we uh, talked about this today. I know this is a biggie. So I'm just here to answer questions. <laughs> okay. Um, first, Chris, and then Dorothy. Um, so Brian, do did they give any definition definition on um, what depletion means? Uh, whether whether depletion can be calculated. <laughs> no, they have not. <laughs> is, there, is it allocation per state, or is it just? Uh, we, we I think the whole. I think the whole. I think a lot of folks in the country just got this sent to them um, very quickly. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Dorothy. I'm sure you considered this. I can't believe you haven't. But does that mean we're going to be running buses to deliver the food to the remote learners? No. No, I'll let Stephen talk more about that, uh, but no. <laughs> no, so U32 is going to support uh, remote learners uh, meal service because we have, uh, we'll have two grade levels out on any given week. Um, but we're the only, what we're looking at right now is doing delivery to the, um, the elementary schools for pickup for people who need those meals. Um, we might be able to get it to once we can figure this out, because it just changed on us, um, we might just have a couple of pickups a week so that people can pick up multiple meals um, at one time. And I think just to, to reinforce one of the things that Brian said, this is breakfast and lunch. Oh, yeah. um, and so it's uh, it's uh, free breakfast and lunch. So we, we expect to at least double our breakfasts and who knows where lunches are gonna end up. Teenagers tend to be able to eat a lot. <laughs> And this, and and I, thank you, Stephen. And I think that uh, not knowing how many people are going to take advantage of this, it's very. We're, again, we're chasing another moving target at the start of the year. Uh, uh, there are some districts, when they go from fifty percent to one hundred percent or ninety percent, you typically have to hire more people to to do food service. And we don't know if that's the case or not. Uh, I'm not committing to that, but you know, this that's some of the. So there's always a trade off, right? Thank you. Diane. You know, I, I definitely appreciate the amount of work that it is, but I think it reflects the amount of need that we have in our communities and that certainly even with schools opening up, um, we still have families that are struggling for that food security. So um, I, I just, I'm, I'm glad that that uh, decision has been put out there and 
certainly appreciate that, but also please turn to the community for what we can do to help as well. Thanks, Diane. Yeah, um, and leave it to government to do a great thing um, and at the same time, create the maximum of uproar to get it done. Um, so uh, other, other questions for Brian on this one? Do you have more, Brian? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> How about it? Okay, so I was asked to provide an update. We'll have more, we'll have final numbers at the September 16th meeting, uh, but the uh, early retirement update numbers, so currently, uh, the early retirement option was sent out to 55 people. 23 people have responded so far. 11 have taken it. Uh, I, I think the board has approved a few, uh, some of that 11 uh, at several meetings. Still have a few more that can't, are coming in. So we'll uh, you know, process them as well. The deadline is uh, Tuesday, September 15th. And so we projected 22 people would take it. So right, again, right now, as of right now at this moment, it's 11, but we will know the final number at the September 16th board meeting. September 16th. Thank you very much, Brian. It would be a very um, interesting question. board meeting. <laughs> um, questions on this? Diane? I know part of what we were talking about in doing this was basically looking at how um, how it might potentially help us as we uh, struggle with our balance, our budgets. Uh, what I think, because all transparency out there, my husband is one of the ones taking an early retirement. Um, and so, but I what I'm realizing as I was looking at that list is that they are positions that are going to be tricky to fill. And so, um, that was one of those consequences I didn't think about at all. And um, so it will be interesting as we navigate through, whether it was a cost saving or just an adventure in, as you were saying, some challenging waters ahead. Comments, Brian? <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, 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 I can't say anything. That was great. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Great. Um, any other any other questions on the early retirements? If not, Brian, anything else? No, no more. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, that was thank very you. rich. Um, so uh, let me. Can I just do a quick um, pulse check? Do you do you want to take a break or do you want to just power through? Let's power through because then it looks like we have a lot left. Okay. Power through. Power through. All right. You saw a sign that said power through, Scott. <laughs> <Sorry. Great>. Okay. <laughs> um, if anybody needs to take a break, however, they're, they're of course, excused for um, whatever it takes. Um, Scott, I'm going to so, take, take you up on that. I'll be back in five. Okay. See you, Janice. We won't do anything big while you're gone. Um, Finance Committee, Flora? It, yes, talking about anything big. But so the Finance Committee met today at 5.30. We had just one item in our agenda. We approved our minutes from July. And the second, the discussion item was the Calas Road sign uh, request. So after discussing it at length uh, with the members of the committee, we unanimously agreed that we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't support this at this moment uh, and that we will look at a policy and we'll, uh, we'll consider developing a policy uh, related to so that we don't set precedent. So a policy will be considered and developed uh, at the policy committee, but we would not take this as uh, our recommendation. Of course, we can we can talk about it, but uh, that was the, the four of us all felt like this was not uh, for us right now. Yeah. And then the last thing that we discussed uh, in the in the finance uh, meeting was looking ahead at future items uh, in our agenda. So this is a session for for Lori, and uh, uh, Carrie had asked an important question uh, uh, 
almost like a month ago about doing some research in the property tax collection. And since uh, Brian shared, you know, that the at one is looking better, I think it was worth sharing that we do not, uh, it looks like it hasn't been, uh, the, the cash flow at this time is, it's okay. It looks like if anything, there might be something that is coming a little late, but after doing research, we would be, uh, we're not in any um, adverse situation to not having the funding from, from, our, from our towns. Um, other than that, I don't know if you have, if, how do you want to do the sign, uh, Scott? Um, I think uh, if we want to just table it by consensus until um, the policy committee or, or bucket to the policy committee. Yeah, but, but I think that Callas is looking for an answer. So I think we, we as, a, as a board, either we, put this motion on the table and say that we support the recommendation from the board so that Callas have some- Some uh, guidance some, to go some, by. Well, yeah, but at least knows that they should go ahead and buy the sign by themselves, not with our funding. Stephen? Um, I would recommend we make a motion yeah. and we can debate the motion and vote on it. So exactly. I, would, I would make a motion that we fund the Callas request um, this, the callous uh, sign request, if that's an adequate motion. Mm -hmm. And then if someone, if no one seconds it, our work is done. If someone seconds it, we have discussion and vote on it and they have their answer tonight. So Stephen has moved. Do we have a second? Dorothy seconds. Very good. So we have um, open for discussion. Stephen, look. Stephen, um, I didn't hear you. I, I think you're muted, Stephen. Sorry. My first question is this legal. Can a school district jointly own property with a town? Uh, I think Lori had, if Lori is, um, is actually listening to this, she had um, a valuable take on this situation, but but Brian, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sidestepping protocol. I should go to you and you go to Lori. Um, however, you're muted too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you, Scott. I, I, and I uh, would, I would let Lori talk about that one. We, we just, I, we were just in that meeting. But Lori, uh, you there? I am, but I did take a break, so I'm not quite sure what the question is. Is the Callis road sign request legal? Um, I didn't speak to the legality of it. What I spoke to um, was, is it in compliance with an educational expense under Title 16? So I was trying to um, give the example that we share uh, resources with towns, with generators, because those are an eligible expense if the school needed a generator. Uh, but this sign, which would be portable throughout the town, doesn't necessarily um, come to, be, to me the way I understand it to be an <clears throat> educational expense because it would be traveling throughout the town. So I had recommended that the policy committee, if they were going to take this up, mm -hmm. uh, check Title 16 and, and confirm whether or not it would fall under an educational expense for students. Did I miss something, Floor, based on what you were looking for? It, no, it was it was Stephen that asked the, the question. And but but yeah, clarifying clarifying that that is not um, that you will have to disclose it. And could you talk a little bit more about right. what that would sure. mean for tax? Um, yes, once a year, um, we are asked to share um, with the state expenses that are payments to the towns. Um, and this would have to show up on that report this coming year. And what they do is they're looking for items that aren't necessarily educational expenses um, throughout the state, not just for us, um, to confirm our, should they have gone through a municipal tax or an education tax.
so um, Stephen, it's not it's not a, a direct answer to your question about legality, but it is the relationship to the law. I, I'm satisfied with the answer. Okay, thank you. Um, Chris McVeigh. Um, so when we consider this, um, um, I would urge that we um, take into account the sharing of resources when we can with towns, um, because um, uh, we are certainly parts, you know, bordering on our towns, and um, there's there's great benefit for us as well as the town to share. Uh, one of the examples that comes to mind very clearly right now is that in Middlesex, um, we've requested permission from the town to use a part of the town property for setting up outdoor classrooms. Uh, now, this, this came up last night, I, and I wasn't at the, the meeting, um, and I'm assuming the town said yes, and they put on certain conditions. So, you know, having that flexibility on this sharing resources when we can, uh, can be mutually beneficial um, when it is mutually beneficial. And so we should, we should, I don't think we should dismiss it out of hand uh, when we take up a policy on it. Um, but for now, I think we do need the policy, so we should we shouldn't support this motion at this time. Thank you, Chris. Lindy. Um, I agree about the land and sharing those kinds of resources. This, to me, doesn't fall in that same category. As far as personally living in other places, when kids had to cross a street, then I can see the safety type issues of the road and crossing guards and things like that because it supports the school you want the safety of the kids because they have to cross the street but um i think if we were to support this then we need to put flashing speed signs at all the schools in the district that I, berlin's the first one that comes to mind that might not need it because they're off of the main road but um I think of out in front of East Montpelier where it's paved, it's straight, and it's a little racetrack. Um, so I just, I think that's more of a town's responsibility for the safety of their roads versus what Lori was saying, it's not an education expense in that sense. The sharing of resources like the town forests or the land and things like that, I'm all for and hope we have a mutually, just like our rec fields and things, they're owned by the towns, but schools use them. Um, I just don't think this sets falls in the same category. I'm not even sure why it would need a policy because it's a piece of equipment for the town um, that doesn't seem to have a, an educational purpose. Uh, Fleur. So uh, Lindy, the, the only reason we, we suggested a, a policy was to not set precedent so that if this type of issues may, it might not be a road sign, but it might be something else that comes to the board, we have a way to address it so that it's equitable to all the towns. So not necessarily to, to just the road sign, uh, right? So it will be looking as a whole so that like next time we don't have to revisit the entire conversation on how we address requests to the school for for money. So that's the idea, part of the idea of the, and, and looking at what uh, Lori shared uh, with us, uh, how you know we can't really share expenses. And then I just wanna say that we, the other thing that we discussed is like, we, we are all for safety. We will all agree on that. We're all for safety. We're all a, that is not a it's not a big expense, but is is how do we draw the line right in what we would be required? You know what's next. So it's a, it's important to have a good partnership with the town, but it's also important to have and and everybody agreed on that uh, to have defined lines. So what are our responsibilities? And at this time, we have so much in our plate that doesn't make sense for us to take one more thing uh, on too. Thank you, Flora. Others? If not, I might recognize myself. And um, from my perspective, what this is really about is that um, that other third rail issue we have, which is redistribution of debt service. And um, I think that's that's what needs ultimately to be settled in some way. And I think there are 
there are ways to settle it. And uh, I can think of at least one. Um, so that should be um, that should be the direction for essentially for callous at least in um, in avoiding any further sort of repeats of this type of um, approach. Uh, and Jonas, please. I fail to see how this is about the redistribution of tax burden at all. Is, are, are, are you suggesting that this is somehow the result of Callus's grievance against the merger process? I, I don't think it's unrelated, if I can put it that way. I think um, you remember last year, there was also the- um, The elections issue. The elections, exactly. Um, but this is, I, I know there's a, there's sort of a, um, every, nobody wants to deal with this issue, but I think it has to be dealt with in order to, to finally, um, you know, bury some of these, let these ghosts rest finally. Um, I, it, it, yeah, yeah if, if I may, I thought that the vote we took earlier this evening was about putting that to rest. Um, the debt issue should have nothing to do with with this, and I find it um, um, disappointing that this has been injected into this conversation. If Callus feels that it has a legitimate, you know, safety issue then we should discuss that. Um, I would be interested, you know, I would argue that we should, to that we should not approve this tonight as a way of deferring the decision until the policy committee, you know, as a number of people have said, can get together, look at the legality of this, look at the appropriateness of this and figure out where we can draw the line. But I think to draw, to bring in the, 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 the merger uproar um, is, is, is distracting and has zero to do with this. I would, uh, however, having said that, I'd be interested to hear what your thought is about how to resolve this because it is not in our hands. We have no recourse to do that. It is in the hands of the legislature um, and we are not the legislature. I, I believe it's a future agenda item on the finance committee. Um, Stephen Luke and then um, Fleur and then Chris McVeigh. So I, I'm, I'm not gonna refute that it's not wise to schedule time to talk about this. That has nothing to do with my motion. My motion are, is, are we gonna support this payment or not? Or uh, you know, if, if there's some other action we're gonna take. I, I fully support having a discussion that has been alluded to here, but I, I'm adamant that this is not the time to have that discussion. Let's make a decision on this motion and then move on, please. Agreed. Um, thank you. Uh, Fleur and then Chris. I, I was just going to say what Stephen said, which is the same thing that I said at our finance meeting. That I'm glad to put this as a future item in our agenda. The question is, do are we willing to pay for this sign at this moment? Are we capable to take in that action today? Yes or no? So that's it. Okay. Thank you. Chris. I'm Scott. I was just doing isometric exercises. That's why my hand was up. Uh, <laughs> Turn your video off when you do that, please. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> I, I, I just, um, I've lost track of the motion on the table. Um, I, I, I personally don't feel like I can support voting on this tonight, but I'm comfortable with the policy committee considering it. But I think our motion is more uh, uh, specific than that or sort of more specifically action oriented so I've just lost track. Um, the motion was and correct me if I'm wrong Stephen to approve the um, the callous request for um, contribution okay. to this sign. So are we ready for a vote then? Yeah all right. So as, um, as always, if you're in favor of contributing to the purchase of this traveling um, speed sign, 
please click yes. And if you're opposed, click no. Okay, um, one yes and all the rest no. And if I may explain my vote, it's because I think it's about something else, not about this really. So um, let's move on to the consent agenda, approved minutes of August 19. Um, they're on page 17. Does anyone want to move them? Diane? I move we approve the minutes of whatever the date, August of August 19th. Of August 19th. Very good. Um, anyone else to second? Jonas seconds. Very good. Uh, any any changes? How do they look? Look okay? Great. So um, all in favor of approving the minutes of August 19, please click yes. Opposed, click no. Floor, there's a no next to your name? Is that, oh, okay. Okay, all in, unanimous. Okay, very good. Thanks everyone. So um, for approving the board orders, does anyone have them open and easily accessible? Jonas, please. Uh, I move to approve the board orders in the amount of $667,785.59. Thank you, Lisa. And $256,868 and 98 cents. Thank you, Lisa. Great, thanks very much. Is there a second, please? Floor seconds. Um, any questions? Everybody okay with voting? All in favor, please click yes. And opposed, click no, of course and it's unanimous in favor. Thank you very much. All right, <clears throat> moving on, we have personnel on page 24 of the packet. Um, let's see, would anyone care to make the first motion? It looks as though there are no new teacher nominations, but there are a number of retirements effective at the end of this school year. Um, would anyone have, like to? I have it open, Scott, if you want me to. Please do, Lindy, thank you. Um, I make a motion that we accept the uh, retirements effective June 30, 2021 of the following staff members, uh, Catherine Christie, Elizabeth Worth, James Nichols Fleming, Patricia Fair, Lauren Van Deeren and Mary Ellen, <laughs> Mary Ellen Hill. Thank you, Lindy. Uh, is there a second? Floor seconds. Um, any discussion? <laughs> Floor, yes. Yeah, well, I, I don't know all of them personally, but I, I, I wanna say that Kathy Christie has left the mark and not just at East Montpelier, but our, our district. In, in general on her contributions and she's gonna be missed uh, terribly in helping, you know, coaching our teachers and what she's done for all our kids in all of our communities, especially at East Montpelier. And also with thanks to Elizabeth Worth who has been the nurse for as far as I can remember at East Montpelier and she is gonna be dearly missed. And I let others that know better, I can say more about U32 too, but I let others say at least something for all these wonderful people that have been with us for so many years. Yeah, we extend our gratitude to all of them. I think Diane could say something about one of them. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not sure we want that in print, you know. Okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Great. 
Great. <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, if we go to a vote, all in favor of approving these retirements effective June 30th, 2021, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And um, I'm seeing all the yeses. The motion passes unanimously. Now, um, there's also a change in FTE. Um, do you want me to read that one that too? Motion. Thank you, Lindy. Um, I make a motion that we accept the change in FTE for Karen Lieberman to be increased from 0.7 to 1.0 FTE as a science teacher at U32. And Heather Clark Warner, the EMES pre-K teacher increased from 0.4 to 0.8 FTE. Very good. Is there a second? Floor seconds. Beat you to it, Chris. Um, any any further discussion? <laughs> if not, all in favor, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And once again, I'm seeing all the yeses. Thank you very much, everyone. All right. Um, Returning to the top. So um, round two of public comments um, in which the public gets to express its approbation or disappointment or whatever it might have. Do we have any public comments? Remember, uh, if you raise your hand, if you're in Zoom, or star nine, if you're on the phone. Otherwise, it appears not. So we need to go into executive session for a variety of purposes, several of them under the first section of the <clears throat> the um, section 313 of Title I, and then as well as the student matter. So um, would anyone care to make, oh, whoa, um, sorry. Uh, I'm backing up because I see Jill Drury has um, raised her hand. Sorry, Jill. No problem, thank um, you. Um, I guess my, my question was for Brian, um, going back to the cutoff um, for allowing students to do remote learning. Um, you know, we received the survey, you know, probably what was it back in August, beginning of August, to have us to make a decision whether or not we wanted our kids to do remote or in person. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have much clarification what either would look like at the time. And so still to this day, as a parent, you don't, you don't really know how your child's going to feel once they get into the school. Yeah. Um, there could be a lot of difficulties around wearing masks. Um, there could be difficulties with them learning based on um, outdoor learning. Um, because to be honest, teachers are trying to do more outdoor learning and that doesn't work for every child. Um, I just, my question is, is how can we put a cap on something when you feel that your child's not feeling safe in a school or as a parent you don't feel that your child is getting the appropriate education because we don't know what we're signing up for um, either way and I think that's a really difficult situation for a parent going into this line just like a teacher trying to figure this out as well um, I just think that we can't I understand like capping it because you know next week you could have 20 kids decide to go remote um, but we don't know how these kids are going to feel until they're there. Right. I, yeah, uh, and, and Jill, I, I, I agree with you. That's why I've been um, having conversations with members of my leadership team and other folks to say, let's see how things play out in the next few weeks. I do think maybe the word cap isn't the right word um, after what I'm hearing you're saying that uh, because uh, what I'm hearing you saying is, uh, is there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of, you know, 
folks are you know still think thinking this through and but I, I do think at some time though we do probably I don't know if I have to say a cap but we do have to say hey, you know here's the date we, we've given folks a lot of time we give them a lot of time to process it so uh, I, I would think August early August yes there's some plans were still being fit, finished and, and developed we did put a deadline out there we did uh, re, we do ha have some folks changing their mind right before school starts. And I know that's why I'm, I'm very interested in seeing what happens in the first two weeks of school. Okay, my next question is, so say your child does, you know, the first week of school, maybe even two weeks. And as a family, you come to the conclusion, it doesn't work for your children or for you for them to be either remote or, you know, in person, vice versa. What are the steps that they need to do to do this? Because that wasn't even like kind of, you know, that was never part of like a sign up or aspect of it we're saying oh never mind i changed my mind well right right now uh, i know we have an option we give parents the option of doing one or the other so it's either you send your children to school or we pro provide the remote option and that's what we have right now i, I don't is that, that that's kind of like where we're at i don't know uh well my question i guess is so like say if we go through the first week first two weeks and it's not working for your child do we reach out to the principal or do we reach out to you? Yeah. I would first reach out with the principal and talk to them about what's happening or how you feel, uh, Jill. Uh, I mean, I think that's the first part and then uh, we can uh, go from there. But I do know that at some point, uh, if we're gonna, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, again, this is one of the moving targets, right? Like, uh, you know, that we're chasing right now with the uncertainties of what's gonna happen next week when, when we reopen. You know, we maybe the only certainty, the certainty that we have, the certainties that we have that we put into place, the precautions and things like that. But of course, th things could change, right? Uh, and we, we also don't know if and when the uh, state will say we have to go to state uh, phase three. And I think uh, uh, board member McVeigh also brought it up today that that's something that we're going to have to really think about. Um, you know, because some school, I don't think, you know, in my opinion, uh, do we do we really want to shut down the remote option completely if that happens? So, I mean, that's, I think that's something that we have to really think about and grapple with over these next few weeks. And so, you know, if your question is what happens if, if two weeks go by and I change my mind, I think the longer it goes into the school year, I think it's going to get harder to change your mind until um, you have your child um, until the quarter ends. You know, when the grade end, the grading marking period ends. I think that's where we're thinking about it educationally. Uh, I don't know uh, if that makes you feel any better, but you know, I know that you know, at some point we do have to say, here's the date, here's what, this is it. We can't really do this anymore because um, it just becomes so disruptive to just everyone else uh, in the district as well. Uh, it interrupts the other children. Uh, I mean, if, if, that, if that becomes the case. And yeah, and I agree with, you know, you know, a month from now having a child switching or even two months that can cause havoc. But I think giving these children, you know, our students ability after two weeks of realizing that they can't be sitting in a class or outside wearing a mask and that it's just, it's not comfortable for them that we need to be able to allow them to change their mind. Yeah. And, and I, and I know, uh, and, and from what I understand, Jill, is in my uh, opinion, uh, it takes 18 days to start a habit or break a habit, right? So, I mean, it, this, it's gonna take some time for everyone to get used to what, what we're doing in school. Um, I mean, I think uh, the, having teachers back the last two weeks has been greatly helpful. Uh, has it reduced some anxiety? I think it has. Uh, is it gonna get better as time goes on? I think it will, uh, provided that, you know, the numbers and metrics and things like that continue to happen. Uh, but I, I, I think you bring up. I think you bring up some good points. I do. I just think that you know that's what I'm grappling with too. Is you know where is that deadline? You know we want to be respectful of of what parents want uh, and be respectful. And I guess I, I think the ultimate thing is trying to be flexible as much as possible. Uh, at the same time, there has to be a practical piece where we say, okay, well at this point we can't keep doing allowing folks to just go back and forth and jump in. So. Uh, you know, I definitely will consider, you know, what you're saying about the first two weeks. I do think that the numbers may fluctuate, but it, but I'm hoping that it, at some point they'll be steady. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's all. I just wanted to see if there yeah. was a grace period. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thanks.
Thanks very much. All right, so um, back to the executive session. Do we have a motion to go into executive session? I move to go into executive session. Second. Thank you, Jonas. Um, was that you seconding floor? Chris. Lindy? Oh, Chris, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Floor Jonas, I, move. We're often mis mistaken by our voices. <laughs> uh, you have to be deaf like me um so <laughs> funny um okay um jonas and chris so um all in favor please click yes opposed click no and we're in executive Great. session with brian my name brian yeah yeah and I'd be, I just yeah, wanted Brian, to let Keith, I just wanted to let Keith know to bring Kelly Bushy into executive session with us. Uh, okay, great, very good, thank you. All right. Was the purpose um, for discussing legal matters or, or legal and students? Uh, legal matters and students. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And Keith, will you be going into that meeting uh, to uh, show us, share some documents or no? No, okay. No, I don't have, I don't have. Uh, okay. okay, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Yep.